I'll turn it over to Dean Allman in just a second. I should introduce you to Denise Min Grone, the woman here in the colorful top, who has membership applications to our organization, should anybody be interested. And you can talk to her after the event. Uh, we'd like to thank Dean Jerry Allman for having us here today, hosting this event at Santa Clara University. And uh, he's been doing a great job as Dean here for about four or five years? Six. Six years. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Dean Allman. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the Bench and Bar Historical Society uh, has dealt with a, a whole spectrum of issues uh, ranging from the ridiculous to the sublime. We have litigated whether Paris stole the idea for the Eiffel Tower from the San Jose Electric Tower. Uh, <laughs> we have relitigated uh, some very famous uh, criminal cases in our history, uh, the case of Tiburcio Vasquez, uh, the case of Harry Love, uh, whether he fraudulently collected the, the reward for Joaquin Murrieta's head. Uh, General Nagley uh, recently went on trial. Uh, but today's trial is a very serious one. Uh, it involves the guilt of Jack Holmes, uh, who was one of two men who was lynched and hung in uh, San Jose uh, in St. James Park in 1933. Uh, and it's especially appropriate that we conduct this trial here at Santa Clara University. Uh, the victim of the kidnap murder that uh, Jack Holmes was accused of uh, was Brooke Hart, who had just graduated from Santa Clara University uh, several months prior to his kidnapping and murder. Uh, to introduce the, the uh, players in, in this event, uh, our prosecutor, uh, is John Markham, a professor of law here at Santa Clara. Uh, for the defense, we have Tom Nolan, a well-known defense lawyer from Palo Alto. Um, our star witness is going to be Harry Farrell, who is the author of Swift Justice. And following the trial, uh, Harry will be at the table in the, in the hallway uh, with some copies of Swift Justice. Uh, if any of you haven't gotten the book yet, uh, or if you have and brought it, Harry will be happy to autograph your copy. Uh, so with that, uh, we will proceed. Please remain seated and come to order. The Bench and Bar Historical Society Court of Historical Inquiry uh, is again in session. Uh, the Honorable John Flaherty, Judge Presiding. Instinct. Instinct. All right, good afternoon, please. Uh, Please be seated. This is the case of the People versus Holmes. Could I have counsel's appearances, please? Good afternoon, Your Honor. John Markham for the prosecution. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Thomas Nolan on behalf of Mr. Holmes, who unfortunately is not present. All right. The record will so reflect. And uh, Mr. Markham, are you ready to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Why don't you go ahead with your first witness? Uh, may I make a very brief opening statement? Absolutely. Good afternoon, members of the jury. Jack Holmes is dead. He was lynched. That lynching was lawless, and it was an abomination. To show you how bad it was, Adolf Hitler used that lynching by way of trying to convince German people that we Americans were bad and lawless. And it had an effect in Germany because that lynching was bad, and it was lawless. And we should never revise history to apologize or to make excuses for that horrible lynching. History demands that that lynching, in all of its ugly detail, remain a stark reminder of why our society of laws and courtrooms is much better than the likes of what Adolf Hitler had in mind for us, that he won. But there's another history that is equally as important that it not be revised. And that is the history of what happened to Brooke Hart on the night that he disappeared, was killed, was dumped unceremoniously in the San Mateo, over the San Mateo Bridge into the water by two men who wanted to use this horrible act as a way of getting money. The history, and I don't come here to prosecute, Jack Holmes, as Mr. Nolan says, he's dead. 
Nothing more can be done to him. But I want to prosecute on behalf of the historical fact that Jack Holmes and his accomplice, Harold Thurman, did this horrible act. Just as history demands that we remain true to the horror of the lynching, it equally demands that we remain true to history's first finding. And it was a correct finding. Jack Holmes participated in the murder of this young man, Brooke Hart. Now, you will hear principally from an author who has spent exhaustive amounts of time doing research into what happened. And I'm not going to belabor what I anticipate he will say. Better you hear it from him than from the likes of me, a mere lawyer who hasn't done the work he's done. But what this learned scholar who spent all of his time investigating tells us after his exhaustive inquiry about this fine young man is as follows, and I quote from the book. His ready smile and wide acquaintance had stippled the community with friends. Now, I did not know what stippled meant. So with the help of a colleague, we found it in a dictionary. And what it means is, it means to create something lasting on an easel by repeated small dots of paint. His glowing, vibrant, young personality was capable of stippling that kind of attitude throughout the entire community. Your Honor, I'm going to object at this time. We're here to decide whether Mr. Holmes is guilty. We're not here to decide that Mr. Brookhart was a good person. And the fact of the matter is, is that my client's dead because the community made a decision. This is an opening statement. You gotta say what the facts are. I'm gonna sustain the objection. <clears throat> May I ask then, Your Honor, that when we get to the point in his opening or his presentation that he attempts to suggest that somebody else was involved because this man was a gambler or a womanizer, he be cut off because he's cut me off of this line of inquiry as well. If, Very well. If counsel wants to establish the gambler and womanizer, he can do it through the facts and through the evidence, not in his opening statement. I'll, a I'll ask you to go ahead and finish your opening statement. Sure. Thurman and Holmes kidnapped this fine young man at gunpoint, took him to the San Mateo Bridge, tied him with this clothesline wire to these cinder blocks, cement blocks, and then dumped him unceremoniously to his death in the San Mateo River. After they did it, they cynically sought to recover ransom, promising his beloved father and family that he was still alive and would be returned. If only they would pay $40,000 ransom. A huge sum in 1933 when this happened, the bottom of the Depression. Thurman was later caught telephoning the heart trying to get ransom, thereby showing his guilt. He immediately confessed to his part in the kidnap and murder. He then abruptly and without hesitation led the FBI and the police to the person who he said was his accomplice, Jack Holmes. When Jack Holmes was apprehended, you will hear that from the minute he was apprehended, he made statement after statement implicating himself in this crime. He knew the details of the crime, how it happened, when it happened, who had done it, what Your Honor, until the court has a chance to rule on the admissibility of the confessions, I'd ask that counsel be precluded from mentioning them. So I'm, going, I'm going to allow him some leeway in this okay. regard. <clears throat> he confessed. And you will hear when you listen to the confessions, both Thurman and Holmes, that in essentials, they do not conflict with each other. In essentials, they tell this horrible story. I will not characterize the amount or the strength of the other evidence that you will hear from this learned author, which shows that their confessions could only have been made by the two men involved in this murder. I will let you be the judges on behalf of history concerning that evidence by hearing it from the author. I leave you only with this. I expect that after you've heard the author tell his exhaustive research, you will come to believe that history was correct, that Jack Holmes willfully, deliberately, and with
premeditation, kidnapped, and then brutally murdered Brookhart with the help of an accomplice, Harold Thurman. And I ask you to wait until you've heard all the corroborating evidence before you pass on really the only counter that they have, which is a flimsy alibi contradicted by another flimsy alibi, contradicted yet by another flimsy alibi, all by people who loved him and had a motive to lie for Jack Holmes. All right, thank you. Mr. Nolan, before you begin, uh, there are a few seats up in this side of the uh, rail if, if people want to come on in and, and sit down here, if you can get by. Get a few more folks in here. If you want to just come in and fill in uh, next to Mr. Farrell and on this uh, side of the rail as well. Mr. Campbell, you may sit at my table. <laughs> Sit at my table, too. <laughs> the court recognizes the presence of the uh, district attorney of uh, Santa Clara County, George Kennedy, and alongside him, the uh, former mayor of uh, the city of San Jose, uh, uh, Tom McHenry, uh, who uh, we're delighted to have here. Mr. Nolan, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I did not necessarily anticipate an opening statement. However, have you noticed the emotion the opening statement? Have you felt the emotion? Are you, are you yet ready to go out and, and lynch Mr. Holmes yet again? Are we, on, are we here today to validate what occurred 60 years ago? It seems like we are. But have we heard one piece of evidence, one fact that is subject to cross-examination at this point? I'm sorry that we've heard an emotional opening statement because where have we gotten in 60 years? Have we progressed beyond the point where we were 60 years ago? Counsel for the prosecution wants you to get emotionally involved at this stage of the proceeding. Objection, he Your Honor. Objection, argumentative. Not the place for an opening statement. I'm gonna sustain the objection. <clears throat> Counsel said he wants to make sure that he establishes that there was a correct finding there was no finding, there was a lynching. No justice can come from being swift. I want you to listen to the evidence. I want you to listen to it in a cold, calculated way. I'm, I'm, I, I have a hard time because I'm in the den. You know, I'm in the place where the students were attending when this happened 60 years ago. From reading the book, one gets the idea that maybe some people at this school might have even been involved. I want you to understand that we're not here to correct history or to affirm history. We're here to decide whether Mr. Holmes was or was not guilty, and the burden is on the prosecution beyond a reasonable doubt. So please listen to the evidence and not be swayed by the emotion. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Nolan. Would you go ahead and call your first witness, Mr. Mark? Yes, Your Honor, if I'm not mistaken, this is the court witness. Uh, the author prefers to be called by the court, and we are both allowed to examine him as if we were doing it on cross-examination. I believe that's the way the uh, format was devised. Yes, you're correct. Mr. Farrell, would you step forward, sir? And could we have your full name, sir? Harry Farrell. Farrell? Good afternoon. You have been researching a book recently, have you not? Yes. And would you tell uh, the jury and the audience uh, the book that you've been researching? The book that I have researched and written is called Swift Justice, and basically it is a factual account of the uh, matters we're discussing here today, the heart kidnapping and the lynching which followed. And you have attempted in your book to stick with the facts as you could ascertain them, correct? That's true. And you did not in your book advance any opinion as to whether or not Holmes and Thurman were in fact the guilty parties, correct? Uh, no, I, there are certain places in the book where I discuss 
um, elements of doubt that are bound to remain uh, in the minds of readers, but I do not inject my opinion into uh, the matter at all. So what is stated in the book, so far as it relates to the evidence, is fact as best as you could find it. That's true. Now, Brookhart disappeared sometime in early November 1933, did he not? Uh, yes, at about a few minutes before 6 p.m. on uh, November 9th, 1933. And, sir, where was he last seen? He had left the Hart's Department Store uh, in downtown San Jose to pick up his car at a parking lot to the rear of the store. And he was seen um, leaving the store by the back door. He was, uh, he talked to a friend as he was walking approximately 60 yards to the parking lot and he talked to an attendant at the parking lot and um, at that point uh, it was assumed by them by the attendant that he had gotten into his car and driven away although the uh, attendant's uh, attention was diverted at that time but when the attendant's attention came back Brookhart was gone that's true his car was gone that's right his car had previously been there yes it was a fair assumption on the part of that man, wasn't it? That he got into his car and left? Yes. And did your book uncover where it was that he had indicated that he was going to go once he got his car? Yes. Um, he uh, left five minutes early before quitting time at the store because he had to take his father, Alex Hart Sr., who was the head of the firm, uh, to a meeting of the uh, San Jose Chamber of Commerce directors at the San Jose Country Club. Uh, Alex Hart Sr. did not know how to drive an automobile. And so he was to pick, get his car out of the lot and pick up his father five, uh, five minutes later and also his sister and take her home uh, from the store. He never went to get his father. Never showed up. And that was surprising, wasn't it? Yes. You wrote that he was a man of good habits. About um, three and a half hours later, yes. And that was not the first time that that person called to demand ransom, correct? That was not the last time? Uh, no, there were two calls that night and uh, many subsequent calls. They indicated that they had kidnapped Brookhart. Right. Was Brookhart ever discovered after it had been determined that he was kidnapped? Alive? Well, either way. He was, he was never uh, seen alive again. There were some um, men gathering wood on the, uh, who, um, near the, um, east end of the San Mateo Bridge, who later said they heard his um, calls for help, but he was never seen again al alive. When was the next time his body was seen? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. When was the next time his body was discovered by people who could ascertain that it was On um, about 9 o'clock on the morning of uh, Sunday, the 26th of November, so it's about 17 days after the kidnapping. So. Your book found that he was kidnapped and murdered. My book uh, recounts the story on, on that basis and then also discusses the possible uh, exceptions. And there came a time during this series of ransom phone calls, did there not, that the police who were trying to find the kidnappers traced a ransom call and went to the place where the ransom caller was making the call, correct? Right. Who did they find when they got to that phone, sir? They found uh, Harold Thurmond. After they found Harold Thurmond, they arrested him, correct? Right. And after they arrested him, he confessed, didn't he? He was grilled um, most of the night. The, he was arrested about uh, 8 o'clock, I think. And uh, after several hours, he first denied everything and eventually confessed, yes. And when he confessed, 
he indicated that he had been working with Holmes on this kidnapping. Objection, Your Honor. It's in violation of the Aranda Bruton rule. I have no right to cross-examine Mr. Thurman. You guys are really taking this seriously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sustain the objection. Your Honor, I'm not offering the, the confession for the truth of the matter, but for the fact that the later confession by Holmes is corroborated piece by piece for Thurman. The objection sustained. Very well. May I ask the court then for a stipulation that counsel will not mention the substance of Thurman's confession either? Okay. Fair is fair. If, if he raises it, then you'll certainly be entitled to go back into it. Very well. All right. I'm going, with, I'm going to withdraw the objection. Thank you. <laughs> Thurman confessed, did he not, sir? Yes. And he said that he had been working with Holmes, did he not? Yes. And he said that Holmes and he had picked up Brooke Hart, didn't he? Uh, he said that, uh, yeah, in, a, in, in essence, that was true. Holmes was the one who actually intercepted him in the in the automobile, according to Thurman's testimony. Where was it that Thurman said that occurred? At the driveway of the parking lot. The place where he was last seen? Uh, yes. And Thurman said that they took Brooke Hart somewhere, correct? Right. Where? To uh, a spot on Evans Road, which was it is in the hills behind Milpitas at that time, far out in the country. And that is where they abandoned Brookhart's car, correct? According to, to what they said, yes. According to what they said? Right, oh. right. Thurman now and Holmes later. Right. Where did the police find the car that Thurman and Holmes said they abandoned on Evans Road? They found it there. Right where the confessors said it was, correct? They had found it first, and then, of course, the confessions um, uh, upheld what they had already discovered. After Evans Road, where did Holmes and Thurman next take Brookhart? To the um, San Mateo Bridge, the, the eastern end of it in Alameda County. What did uh, Thurman say that they did to Jack, or to Brooke Hart after they got him to the San Mateo Bridge? Uh, that um, he was driven out about half a mile onto the bridge. That uh, in Thurman's version, that Holmes had hit him over the head with a brick. Then that he had uh, bound him with wire and that they had thrown him uh, over the side uh, into the bay. But before throwing him over the side to the bay, they tied him up with some uh, clothesline cable. Did they not? Right, yes. And after they tied him to the clothesline cable, what did they tie the cable to? Uh, <clears throat> Thurman's version of Thurman's confession does not specify um, well, what they tied the cable to. Holmes's makes it clear that they uh, weighted him down with uh, concrete blocks. And. Ultimately, where was the body of Brooke Hart found? In the water, uh, some distance south of the bridge and uh, off the Alameda shore. And the body was found after they confessed to that's where they threw it off, correct? Yes. And did anybody find the cement blocks that Holmes said that they used? Yes. Where were those cement blocks found? In the area that they were dragging where uh, the um, uh, Suspects said they had dumped uh, um, Hart's body, and then one of the blocks and part of the and the leftover wire were discovered uh, further back toward the shore where they had jettisoned them after the act. So Holmes said in his confession that Hart was dumped over the side, lashed to blocks. Correct. Right. Those blocks were later found in an area consistent with that part of his confession. Correct? Yes. As of the time that he said that those blocks were thrown over, lashed onto Brooke Hart, the police didn't know anything about those blocks, did they? No. They later found them where, approximately where Holmes said they would be found, correct? Right. And later, the police searched Holmes's car, did they not? Yes. And that was the car that both Holmes and Thurman had said they had used to drive the victim 
to the bridge, correct? That's correct. And what did they find on the floor of that car that was used to drive him and these blocks to his they, death? They found a crumb, crumbs of cement. Crumbs of cement matching the exact cement of the blocks, correct? Presumably. And Mr. Holmes was not in the cement business, was he? Hardly. He wasn't employed, was he? I'm sorry? He was not employed, was he? Uh, at, this, at the time he was arrested, he was not employed. He had been employed until very shortly before that as a salesman for the Union Oil Company. Not having anything to do with cement? Not having anything to do with cement. And did your investigation uncover who had acquired these cement blocks which Holmes said that he and, Th and Thurman had used to kill Brookhart? Yes. Who had acquired them? Thurman. How long before the kidnap murder was it that Thurman had acquired these cement blocks? To the best of my recollection, it was about the 1st of November, so it probably would have been nine or 10 days before the, uh, the kidnap and murder. And did you, your investigation disclose whether either Thurman or Holmes had purchased any of the wire that was used to tie the victim to the cement blocks? Yes. Where, <coughs> sir? At a, um, the Vargas General Merchandise Store here in Santa Clara. Before the kidnapping? Either on the day of the kidnapping uh, which was Thurman's recollection, or the previous day, which was the tentative recollection of the um, uh, clerk who sold him the wire. And Mr. Holmes said he used a gun, did he not, to uh, force Brooke Hart to go with him? Yes, he did. He first said, <clears throat> as Thurman had earlier, that he simulated a gun with his hand in his pocket, but then he changed his, um, his uh, story in mid-confession and said he did use a gun. Well, didn't take him very long to change his story, did he? About six words of the confession. Right. He was going along and he said, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. I did have a gun, yeah. correct? And what kind of gun did he say he had? It was a, I've forgotten the caliber, 42, 41 bolt, I think. 41. Is that what it was? That's what Did your you book said. Would you accept that? If that's what the book said, it's right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, sir, as of this time, when he mentioned that 41 caliber uh, pistol, the police didn't know anything about the nature of the gun, did they? Now, which time are we talking about? When Holmes was fir first said, well, I used a gun and it was no, a 41. No, they didn't know anything about it. So that was something that he supplied them that they didn't know, correct? Right. Just like the cement blocks, correct? Right. Just like the wire, correct? Right. Just like the location of the body, correct? Uh, yes, except that some of this came from Thurman, some came from Holmes. No. And, but the gun came from Holmes. Uh, the first definite mention that he had a gun, yes, he said that. Now, did the police subsequently investigate whether or not there was any corroboration of either Thurman or Holmes acquiring a gun? Yes. And what did uh, your investigation tell you that they discovered? Um, my investigation is based on, on the record, on, on the published record of the case, but they had uh, talked to a um, a man who had been on, um, I believe, Holmes's, he had a, a, a garage on Willow Street, I think. He was one of Holmes's customers, and Holmes knew that he had a gun for sale and um, uh, sent around Thurman to purchase it. All right. So Holmes made initial contact with a man owning a 41 caliber, correct? Yes. And Holmes said a friend of his was going to come by and pick it up, correct? Approximately that, yeah. And after that was said, who came by to pick up the gun? Uh, Thurman. And that was something that uh, Holmes told the police by using the gun. 
before they discovered anything about a 41 caliber from this man that they talked to, correct? Um, I don't recollect from my research without going back and consulting my notes in the book exactly um, how that information came to the police. Uh, they, they went out and, and interviewed the garage owner, I know that, the, uh, the FBI and the sheriffs. Uh, and that was the after the confession? The yes, yeah, afterward. So they asked about it because they learned of it from Holmes. About the I, think that's right. I think that's right. Now, after Brookhart was thrown off the bridge, um, what did Holmes say that the two of them did? Thurman and Holmes. <coughs> um, Thurman went down on the stringers below the deck of the bridge and uh, fired uh, several shots from the from the gun, ac according to uh, Holmes, into the um, water at approximately the place they thought the body had had disappeared. And during this time, um, Holmes was turning the car around uh, so they could drive back off the bridge. I think he pulled up a little bit and turned around. Your Honor, excuse me. With the time constraints the court has imposed on this trial, uh, I'm a little concerned about not, not having a sufficient chance to defend Mr. Holmes. And I would ask that the court uh, restrict counsel at this point so that uh, we can have a chance to defend uh, I think that's, that is appropriate. Mr. Markham, how much longer do you Oh, about three more minutes. That's fine. All right. Um, <coughs> thereafter, they went back to San Jose, correct? Right. And then Thurman, in his confession, said that he went to San Francisco and threw a wallet that he had gotten from Brookhart into the San Francisco Bay, correct? Right. Where was that wallet discovered? On the deck of an oil tanker named the Midway, which was tied up at the San Francisco waterfront. Consistent with where he said he threw it? Yes. And after Thurman had finished his confession, they asked Thurman where Holmes was, correct? Yes. And Thurman knew precisely where he was, correct? Right. And it was 3.30 in the morning, and they went over to where Thurman said Holmes was, correct? Approximately 3.30, the best that I could determine. Room 91 of the California Hotel. Right. And who was there? Holmes. And when, Brooke, and when uh, Thurman knocked on the door at that ungodly hour, Holmes didn't say, what are you doing here, did he? Excuse me, Your Honor. I'm going to object lack of a warrant, arrest at someone's home at 3.30 uh, in the morning. There was consent uh, to the entry, Your Honor, if I could proceed. It was you can't a make an arrest at someone's home at 3.30 in the morning, Judge. Well, I... I there wasn't I'm, consent to entry. My understanding was he opened the door. He didn't come out of the threshold. If he'd come out on the threshold, maybe they would have had an opportunity. Well, I'm going to allow Mr. Markham to lay a foundation Thank about you. how this occurred. Go ahead. This was, of course, after they had the confession of Thurman implicating Holmes, correct? Right. And based on that information, they went and knocked on the door, did they not? Right. All right. And they arrested, and, and who opened the door? Holmes. And what did he say? I'm going to, again, object. I'm going, going to say. allow it subject Fine, to a motion you. to strike. All right. <clears throat> what did he say? What did Holmes say? At 3.30 in the morning when somebody knocked on his door. He said something to the effect that I've got, I'm an honest man, I've got to go out and look for a job tomorrow, and what do you bothering me at this hour of the morning. Now, that, that's a, a paraphrase. I don't remember his But effect. what he first said, isn't it correct, sir, is, who is it? If the book says that, he said it. <laughs> well, I don't want there to be any doubt about this. And this is my last point. Let's read your book right there. Holmes says, who is it? Right? Yes. And... Thurman says, it's me, Harold, correct? Right. And Holmes doesn't say, what are you doing at 3.30 in the morning, does he? No, he, he said. He says, OK, wait a minute, I'll let you in. Just a minute, yeah. All right, just a minute. And then, when the door is open and he's arrested by the FBI, Thurman says something to Holmes, doesn't he? Uh, yes. He says, I told him everything, doesn't he? Uh, he, yes, he does say that, exactly. And Holmes doesn't say, what are you talking no, about? Objection, does not an argumentative. No, I'm going to allow this. this is... no, Holmes he doesn't, doesn't say, what are you talking about, does he? No, he doesn't. What does he say, sir? 
The hell you did. What did you do that for? <laughs> I have more, but in the interest of fairness, if I could have one minute for redirect, I would appreciate it. All right, that'll be fine. Mr. Nolan, go ahead with your example. Thank you very much. Mr. Farrell, isn't it true that uh, there's some serious question about whether or not Mr. Holmes in fact voluntarily confessed? Isn't that right? He uh, contended to his family, and to his parents and his wife that he did not, that, that the confession was obtained under duress. More than duress, it, that he was kept up, that he was threatened. That's what he, con that's what he uh, contended, yes. Wasn't advised of his right to have a lawyer. No, he was not. He was arrested at three in the morning, he was taken to San Francisco, and the alleged confession was at one in the afternoon, correct? Approximately, yes. Now, in fact, Mr. Thurman's confession, according to the FBI, was done in a manner that was very, in the words of the FBI report, vigorous. Isn't that right? Um, some such word as that was used in, in an FBI report, yes. And that was as to Mr. Thurman's alleged confession, correct? Yes. Now, the prosecutor said that, uh, that somehow it was Mr. Holmes who first mentioned a gun in his confession. You recall that testimony? Yes. That there's an implication that the police did not know about a 41 caliber weapon before they talked to Mr. Holmes. You recall that testimony? Uh, yes. Isn't it true that Mr. Thurman, Mr. Thurman said when he was arrested and before Mr. Holmes' confession that there was a 41 caliber pistol in Mr. Holmes' car? When he was... Uh, uh, in his confession, Thurman, as I recall, says that Holmes simulated a pistol. Well, isn't it true, though, that according to your book, you said, and this is at the point at which Mr. Thurman takes the police to Mr. Holmes' car in the plaza garage, right after his confession. And your book says, Bertelli and Black searched it without finding the 41 caliber pistol that Harold said should be under the rear seat. That's right. So, in fact, the police knew about that before Mr. Holmes' alleged confession. Isn't that right? I, as I recall the time element, yes, they, they must have known about that. And they knew about the bricks before Mr. Holmes allegedly confessed. Isn't that correct? They knew, they were, knew about a brick that, um, according to Thurmond, uh, Holmes had used to batter in uh, Burkhardt's skull. I don't think Thurmond mentioned weighting the body down with, with the box. The existence of the bricks was known to the police before Mr. Holmes... The existence of some bricks, yes. Uh, I believe the witness said a brick, Your Honor, was known. The existence of Mr. Thurman mentioning a brick or bricks was known. Objection that compound. That pretty I can ask a leading question to this witness, Your Honor. I, I'm going to allow him to ask the question. Uh, could you repeat the question, sir? You don't know whether Mr. Thurman mentioned a specific brick or bricks. <laughs> no, not really. But they were aware of the existence of a brick or bricks before talking to Mr. Holmes, correct? Same objection, compound question. No, I'm going to allow the question. Yes. And they were aware that they found a car and the location of that car before they talked to Mr. Thurman and Mr. Holmes. Isn't that correct? Oh, yes. These are, they were also aware that Mr. Holmes went to a garage and had his radio fixed by having a screw fixed, isn't that correct? I believe that is in Thurman's confession. And they knew that before Mr. Holmes allegedly confessed, isn't that correct? Yes. In fact, it is Mr. Thurman who told them where the crime occurred, correct? Uh, yes. He told them how it was done, correct? Yes. Told them where the car was? Um, yes, basically, right. He told them about the gun. He told them about the brick or bricks. He told them about the ties. He told them about the car. He told them about the ransom notes. With the exception of the gun, he said the gun was simulated. 
in his confession. But, but then at, at, uh, at some later point, he presumably told him about the gun. It's not in the confession. I understand it's not in the confession, but apparently it was known to the police before Mr. Holmes confessed. Yes. And it was Mr. Thurman who presumably made the phone calls, isn't that correct, for the ransom? Yeah, uh, the first ones, yes. It was Mr. Thurman who, in fact, was caught at the phone trying yes. to get ransom, isn't the that The final right? one he made also. Mr. Thurman and Mr. Holmes knew each other but were not close friends, were they? They were close friends. For, uh, Thurman and Holmes? Yes. They were close friends for about a year. Close friends? Yes. They were different people, though, weren't they? I'll stipulate to that, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> would you rephrase your question? In fact, they would not normally go in the same circles, isn't that correct? That's true. Um, I wouldn't venture an opinion on that, whether they would go in the same circles or not. They were different types, different personalities, but they might well have been friends and might well have been friends in, under any number of circumstances. Mr. Holmes was a, was a happy man, wasn't he? Uh, he was a well-liked man. Whether he was happy, I don't know. He appeared to be a happy man, correct? Um, he uh, was good at conveying that impression, yes. Well. If, if you don't have an opinion, isn't it true your book says that Holmes was to all appearances a happy man? Isn't that right? At one point, uh, uh, I know that I wrote that. I'm not quite sure exactly in what context. He had a promising future? Isn't that right? He had a job in 1933. That's pretty good. Isn't it true that prior to this occasion today, you have written that he was a man with a promising future? Okay, if I wrote it, it's right. He was well-liked, was he not? Yes, he was well-liked. He was respected around town, isn't that That's correct? true. Yeah. He was a self-taught pianist, isn't that correct? Yes. He was married, he had children, isn't that right? He was a good family man in that respect, isn't that That's correct? right, yes. He lived at the home of his mother, isn't that correct? His mother-in-law. Mother-in-law, I'm sorry, his wife's mother. Yes. And in fact, he was, he was a employed during a time when that wasn't necessarily easy. Isn't that correct? That's right. He was a good-looking, handsome man? Yes. Um, and on the day that this crime occurred, by the way, he also was a man that other people later on said was fixated on the perfect crime. Isn't that correct? One, uh, <clears throat> a person who had um, gone to San Jose State with him taking some courses over there, uh, uh, told that to, I believe, the San Francisco Chronicle. And, and in fact, thought that he, he was meticulous in being incensed that, that a crime would occur that, that wasn't well planned. Isn't that right? Yes, basically. If you, if you believe the confession of Mr. Thurman, this, this uh, kidnapping was an afterthought. Isn't that right? It was, it was something that they, they planned two days before. Isn't that correct? Um, it seems to me that they talked about it for on several occasions before over a period of weeks. Isn't um, it true that according to the confession, it was just two days before? Why don't we think about, why don't we do this book hard? Why don't we do something with I'm not sure uh, that that was the first time they had talked about it, however. I remember that line in the confession, but I'm not sure that it was the first um, time they had discussed this. Isn't it true that according to Thurman, he called up called up Holmes and says, why don't we do it again today? Why don't we check the place out today? See if he's there. They had checked him out the day before, and uh, yeah, they decided to check him out on the second day, right? They, didn't, they hadn't planned on how much money they were going to offer, isn't that right? I don't know. According they to they uh, settled on the 40000 afterward, but whether they had talked about this, I don't know. Isn't it true? that according to the confessions, there was no plan of where to take him, what to do with him, how to keep him alive, no plan whatsoever, according to the confessions of Mr. Thurman. Your Honor, I can cut this short. I'll stipulate there was no plan to keep him alive. All right. There was 
no plan one way or another. There was no plan to kill him, no plan to, to take well, him. Your Honor, place. I believe that the confession says something a little different. If he's going to grill him well, about the confession, he may, may, I be, recross. may I be heard, Your Honor? Go ahead. Just no. if he's going to ask him about about 17 or 18 pages of confession, perhaps you have the courtesy to put those confessions in front of him, so that the man could inquire uh, about the writings himself. I'm under a time constraint, Your Honor. I understand. And basically, that. I'm trying to establish that from reading the confessions, you get the idea that this was not a well-planned operation. It was not a well-planned operation. It wasn't the kind of thing you talk about it being a perfect crime, isn't that right? Certainly not. And that would be inconsistent with Mr. Holmes' personality, at least as conveyed by one of his friends. Isn't that correct? Yes. Now, isn't it also true that according to all investigators' investigation at the time, Mr. Holmes' day, <clears throat> the day this allegedly happened, was no, was like every other day. He came home about the same time from work, according to his wife and his mother-in-law. Isn't that correct? According to his wife, not his mother-in-law. According to his mother-in-law, he was there that evening from about 6 o'clock until no, about... Uh, she said he came in about 7, I think. And in fact, at 7.25 that night is when people heard the crying of help from the vicinity of where the body was ultimately found and where Mr. Thurman confessed to hitting Mr. Brookhart and leaving him for dead. Isn't that correct? Objection. That misstates Mr. Thurman's characterization. Thurman said Holmes hit him. Your Honor, he has every right to come back on redirect. I'm, I'm going to allow him to redirect, but go ahead with, with your question. Do you uh, recall the question? 725 was the time that someone heard cry from the area in which this crime allegedly occurred, the killing. That's true. That's right. Pinpointing at least a time at which it appears that the act took place on the bridge, correct? Yes. And that time, 725, is consistent with the distances that Mr. Thurman had to travel and the time that Mr. Brookhart disappeared at about 6 o'clock. That, that is a consistent time, isn't that correct? With what they had traveled up to that point. Up to that yes. point. That's right. And in fact, in fact, there was corroboration of the fact that there were vehicles that went up to the Piedmont Road area, which is in the Milpitas area, correct? Piedmont yes. Road that vehicles were seen transporting someone who looked like Mr. Brooke Hart that yes. evening yes. by two very reliable witnesses, correct? According they were... The FBI, very reliable. <coughs> according to the uh, FBI's written reports, they uh, gave the appearance of being very reliable, yes. And even 50 some odd years later, they still felt very strongly that they were right about what they saw, isn't that correct? The younger one did the... the um, it was a mother and her daughter. The, the uh, mother was deceased. I talked to the uh, woman who had at that time been 14 years old, and she corroborated exactly what she had previously told to the police 50 years earlier or thereabout. And they saw two cars, correct? Yes. And they saw a person being taken from one car to the other, correct? Right. Similar to what Mr what Mr. Thurman said happened at about that area, correct? That there was a transfer at that area. That's what he No, said. this is the, where the women saw this was about two and a half miles from the point on Evans Road. At least within the context of Santa Clara County, they were close by, correct? Yeah, within the context of Santa Clara County. And these women saw five people, isn't that right? Right. Five, not two. They, they, five people with apparently having uh, Brookhart in their captivity. And one of the vehicles was identified as possibly a Buick. Isn't that correct? Correct. And neither of the cars involved with Mr. Thurman's family or Mr. Holmes himself or family was in fact a Buick. Isn't that right? No. Uh, um, Holmes's car was a brand new Chevrolet and uh, Thurman was using his father's Pontiac. So I'm correct. Neither was a Buick. Neither was a Buick. And in fact, employees of the store remember seeing two men at least staking out the store in a Buick a few days before the kidnapping. Isn't that correct? One employee said that. Not, I'm not saying employees, you right. used the plural. An employee saw yes. Yes. a Buick staking out the store prior to the kidnapping, correct? Yes. Now, isn't it also true that Mr. Holmes testified 
strike that. Mr. Holmes allegedly confessed to writing the ransom notes. Isn't that correct? Didn't he say uh, that? To writing, um, he said the first one was a joint effort. He wrote most of them, yes, he, he did. Now that alleged confession by Mr. Holmes was after Mr. Thurman allegedly confessed that it was Mr. Holmes who wrote the ransom notes. Isn't that right? Essentially, yes. There were some minor different minor exceptions, but uh, so addressing the, the envelope. Yes. Mr. Thurman's alleged confession looks just like or corroborates, in effect, is corroborated by Mr. Holmes' alleged confession. In that respect, isn't that correct? Yes. And what did we find out five days after Mr. Holmes was executed, or in this lynched? These notes had been sent to the um, FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. for um, analysis there by a document expert named Mr. C.A. Apple. And uh, Mr. Apple, who had the mind of a computer, uh, said that um, he, uh, without regard to what the witnesses has said, um, he thought Thurman had written the notes. Not only thought Thurman, his opinion was that Holmes had not written the note. Isn't that correct? Yes. Holmes had not and Thurman had. Now, isn't it also true, and I know I'm running out of time here, that Mr. Holmes and his wife went to a good friend's house, Gertrude Esterstein, and arrived there between 7.30 and 8 on the evening in question. That Gertrude had her husband there, and that the four of them went to the movie that evening. Isn't that what Gertrude said? Gertrude Estensen, E-S-T-E-N-S-E-N. -E -E she, her, her uh, estimate of the time that um, the Holmeses got to her house was between 7.30 and 8, possibly around a quarter to 8. And that they went to the movie The Three Little Pigs, isn't that correct? That's true. And isn't it also true that the police, when they questioned Gertrude and took down what she said, didn't seem to want to be interested in following up on where Mr. Holmes was actually on the night that he allegedly was Mr. Thurman. Isn't that correct? I think that would require an opinion of, of mine that I wouldn't have any basis for expressing. They, in fact, didn't question her at much length about that, did they? They questioned her about... Um, I don't, re I don't recall the exact amount they questioned her about many things, including her, her relationship with Holmes, and uh, they did uh, talk about where they went that night, but I don't remember the length of the uh, interrogation on that point. And Mr. Holmes' wife confirmed that fact, isn't that correct? That they, in fact, went to the movie? She confirmed it to me in 1989. And didn't she also confirm to the police, or do you recall what She never happened? talked to the police. She never talked to the FBI. She, she never talked to the sheriff or any other newspaper man. She just talked to me. And the police, to the best of your knowledge, never talked to Gertrude's husband. Isn't that correct? To the best of my knowledge. Now, some 50-some-odd, almost 60 years later, he doesn't remember going to the movie, does he? He told me emphatically he did not go to the Three Little Pigs. He said emphatically he doesn't, he didn't see the three little pigs, but he says he doesn't remember going to the movie. Isn't that correct? That's true. He has no recollection at this time. Isn't that right? That's right. This was in 1989. 1989, almost 60 years later. It would not be unusual for someone maybe not to have that recollection, <coughs> especially if it was the three little pigs. <laughs> of seeing the movie. Now, in fact, Gertrude was a well-respected person in the community, was she not? She was a teacher at the, um, I believe at that time, at the Franklin School on Tully Road. And well-respected in the community, apparently according I, to all indications. Isn't I think great? so. I a think good so. good repute. And in your opinion, could have been a highly credible witness in Mr. Holmes' defense, isn't that right? Yes. And it would have been impossible for what... Mr. Thurman said happened to have occurred the way he said it happened if there's any possibility that Mr. Holmes was in fact his wife with Gertrude and her husband going to the movie that night. Isn't that correct? Would have been very 
difficult and required a split second timing uh, of the um, crime to have done all the things that were that happened within the three hours between six o'clock when Brooke disappeared and nine o'clock when they were all supposed to be back at the movie. Or 7.45 would have been impossible. Well, if, if they were back at 7.45, that would have been impossible because mm -hmm. the last cries from the victim were heard at 7.25, and you can't make it down here in 20 minutes. So if Gertrude and, and the wife and everyone else who was with the, Mr. Holmes that night were telling the truth, it would have been impossible, correct? Um, if they were telling the truth and if they were um, not mistaken about the time element uh, uh, when they look back on it. Ms. Gertrude talked to the police very soon after the events and knew the date when this alleged crime took place, isn't that correct? Uh, Gertrude talked to the police um, several days after the men were arrested, so uh, it was probably um, nine or ten days after the, after the event. This was probably the biggest thing happening in San Jose at the time, isn't that right? It certainly was. It was on every front page, every single fact involved in the investigation was coming forth, isn't that right? That's right. People were clamoring to get a result, to arrest someone, isn't that correct? That's a fair statement. And this was done at a time when people were arrested for crimes they didn't commit, isn't that right? Well, I'm not familiar with what the um, was going on all over the country well, at that your, time. Your book says there was a man in the San Jose jail at that oh. moment. Well, your Honor, I object to getting into another trial given the time there, there, was a, there was a man who was um, in the jail and was subsequently found to be innocent, yes. Yeah, I'm going to allow it on the grounds that it's interesting. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Thurman, in fact, confessed, and they had to let a man go from the jail because he was in in the jail being charged with the crime that Mr. Thurman confessed to. That's right, correct? yeah. Swift justice, correct? I, yeah. I have no further questions here. All right. Mr. Markham, go ahead. Speaking of things interesting, there's more to say about Ms. Estenson and her relationship with Mr. Holmes, isn't there, sir? Probably. Well, he had a raging sexual fantasy for her, oh, did he not? Oh, <laughs> your Honor. That's in the book, Your Honor. It's in I the book. I don't care whether it's in the book or not. <laughs> it's interesting I, and I, relevant, Your Honor. I don't oh, think that's going to allow it on both grounds, yes. On the fantasy, <laughs> there's no evidence whatsoever that fantasy ever went any further nor that it was Gertrude's if fantasy I could proceed, I rather than Mr. Holmes' fantasy. I'm going, to, I'm going to allow the district attorney to proceed here. Go ahead. Is the answer to my question yes, he had a sexual fantasy for her? Um, he was uh, chasing her. Yes. <laughs> In your book, you called it a sexual fantasy. A fantasy of running away with her. Then he, uh, then he must have had one. <laughs> and he wanted to leave his wife and run away with her, did he not, sir? Objection, Your Honor. This witness has no idea what Mr. Holmes wanted in regards to this his wife. This is based on what Mr. Holmes said to his no, wife. I, 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 in the book. He I'm going to allow it based Holmes. on what does that have to do with, Ms. with Gertrude's reliability? Well, motive to lie. Well, I, Gertrude's motive to lie? I, I'm going to allow him to, to, uh, to go into this. Go ahead. Holmes had, um, had suggested to Gertrude that, they, that he would leave his wife and that they would run away and get married and um, Mrs. Holmes was aware of this. And in fact, when Mr. Nolan asked you whether Mr. Holmes was a well-adjusted, happy man in all respects, that's not quite true, is it? I don't see, that, that calls for an opinion on my part, but I don't see how anyone who, invo who was involved in these events in any way could be uh, well-adjusted and happy in all respects. He had left his wife, had he not, sir? He did not leave her until after the kidnap and murder. He left her on the Monday following the kidnap and murder. Because of the conversation about Ms. Estenson, where he uh, told his wife. It was uh, over that issue, yes. And he wanted to run away with her, which in the Depression takes money, doesn't it? I guess it does even now. <laughs> 
But in the Depression, sir, you just can't go from one town to another and get a job. It was very unlikely you could get a job in another town during the depth of the Depression, isn't it? Probably, yes. And so it's probably true that he had a motive to get money to run away with her. That is a fair um, conclusion, I think. And she even went out with him twice without her husband, did she not? Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> and, sir, what she says in her supposed alibi as to when he arrived was that he arrived in her presence slightly b between 7.30 and 8 o'clock at night, correct? Right. And the police did a measurement of the time it would take to get Brooke Hart up to the bridge, dump him, turn around, and come back. Did they not? No, I did it. And it takes less than two hours, correct? It, you can do it in less than two hours. Yeah. So he could have been back before 8, correct? Uh, cutting it pretty close, but I'm not sure he could have gotten back between the 725 point that has pinned down. And I'll get to that. In fact, when the 725 screams were heard, the people who heard the screams didn't see Holmes and Thurman on the bridge, did they? They saw a car on, on the bridge. But not those two men. Well, it was dark. They couldn't recognize anybody. Did they see the men? I don't know. Your book says they didn't see who it was. They didn't see who it was, but I don't know whether they saw silhouettes or not. And in fact, sir, subsequent investigations showed that Brooke Hart had struggled valiantly to stay alive after he was in the water, correct? That is true. And exactly what they heard him say was, help, help, I can't hang on much longer, correct? Right. And they saw claw marks, which had scraped the barnacles clean off of one point at the side of the bridge near where they said they threw him over, correct? Yes. So the fact that he's saying, I can't hold on much longer, suggests that he had been fighting there to try to hold on for a while, correct? Right. He was young. Yes. He was athletic. Right. He was strong. Yes. They had not bound his hands to his side, had they? They bound him like this, so he had some movement, didn't they? Um, I believe he may have, his hands may have been free from the elbows. I'm not, I'm not quite sure of that point. And in addition to that, sir, Ms. Estenson's alibi statement conflicts with her husband's statement that he gave to you, correct? Yes. He says he's never seen three little piggies, correct? <laughs> right. Right. And his earlier acquiescence on that point is inconsistent, as is Miss Estenson's, with what the wife of Holmes said in terms of timing, isn't it? Objection. Yes. And both of those are inconsistent with what Mr. Holmes's parents said about timing, isn't Your Honor, it? Your Honor, I would like to be able to do this forever, but I think we're going to have problem. to. Yeah, we're going to have to uh, call. There are uh, inconsistencies time. between what the parents said and what the wife said. No inconsistency about the fact that he was thrown off that bridge, is there? No. All right. I'm going to give you each an opportunity in in uh, a couple of minutes just to make a brief uh, closing statement. I believe in California, the defense goes first. Go ahead. Why don't, why don't you go first? And we'll just, we'll just have the, uh, uh, the rebuttal statement after your uh, closing statement, Mr. Nolan. I, I am fully aware that, uh, that the court has other matters. And while this is extremely important, I am uh, extremely impressed with the prosecution's ability to draw upon the facts. And I hope that you have some sense of the kind of facts that are now available some 60 years later. Uh, we haven't really, I would like very much to be able to do this uh, in, in a longer um, mock trial, in effect, um, because I think that what you will find, and I hope what you found through just the questioning of Mr. Farrell, uh, who I would thank very much for his, his efforts at trying to be uh, Fair, but it certainly wouldn't sell uh, as many books if uh, if he thought Mr. Holmes were innocent. Uh, and that's not to uh, in any way uh, uh, criticize Mr. Farrell, uh, but rather to comment on the fact that uh, uh, I think there is serious doubt uh, about Mr. Holmes. I think we have to look at the time that this occurred. We have to look at the environment. I don't know that whether you have uh, in this trial a sufficient sense for the hysteria that was developed about this, this young man uh, 
who, who had a promising future and who was dead. Uh, and the desire to, to uh, make everyone feel safe at a time when kidnappings were rampant, when ransoms were occurring, and where there was, to some degree, a, a great deal of lawlessness. And sometimes the execution, uh, lynching, or conviction of an innocent person can seem like an easy way out. Uh, it can seem like a, a sacrifice that, uh, that we as a society might be able to make. And once we start to think that way, I think we give up the idea of being civilized. And I think we give up the idea of being a society that, that respects human dignity and human freedom of every single person. And I hope that in this particular demonstration, you will at least see that there's some question and that, in fact, the wrong thing did occur, that the trial was not had. And who knows what the result would have been but I don't want you to walk out of here saying that this community can live in peace because there was no doubt about Mr. Holmes' guilt. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Markham. <coughs> thank you. Briefly, Your Honor, um, it's not really fair to be that gracious. Now I can't yell and scream and throw the cinder blocks around like that. <laughs> um, but I, I agree with uh, Brother Nolan that uh, uh, the, the real issue here is that a trial is the comfortable place for our society to sort out uh, the doubts and the questions and the out eyebrow raisings that are involved in any um, prosecution. I, I prosecuted cases for years, and I know Mr. Nolan has defended them, and there's never a case around, or virtually never a case, where there isn't some doubt of a niggling nature or a, a large nature. As a society, we can only feel comfortable if there's been a full airing where the likes of uh, a capable uh, Mr. Nolan is allowed to prod at the uh, comfortable assumptions that the prosecutor is trying to envelop everybody in. That's the way our society works best. Um, I don't want anybody to leave this room saying that um, we can rest easy because there's no doubt he did it. Even if, as in my mind, there's no doubt that Mr. Holmes did it. It's not something we can rest about because law, law and justice were not done. There was a shortcut that Adolf Hitler cynically used justifiably against us and in depicting how unfair we were. So I don't ask anybody to leave uh, saying, oh, well, no harm, no foul, because there was a foul regardless of how guilty Jack Holmes was. Um, were we to have the full airing that this trial would have required, which would probably take about two days of careful questioning, um, I believe, based on my reading, that you all would come away with a settled conviction that there is no serious doubt that he did it or participated in it. Um, the, that's easy for me to say because we don't have the two days to do it. Um, however, uh, I do want to end uh, with the point that the, one of the greatest things about our, our society is the fact that uh, um, we have a system which is controlled by an ordered process whereby the truth can out with everybody getting a chance to tell the truth, regardless of how unpopular their cause may be, or in this case, how popular the cause may have been for the prosecutor. And that a judge can sit up there with no apparent means to overpower either Mr. Nolan and I and control the courtroom and make us sit up and, and sit down whenever he wants to. And that's the important glue of our society, which was seriously threatened that night. And I don't mean to cast any uh, suggestion that it wasn't threatened. Um, Thank you for your attention, and uh, I very much enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, I want to uh, thank both of the attorneys, and especially Harry Farrell. I uh, enjoyed reading the book. Dean Ullman has asked, because of time constraints, that I decide the case rather than turning it over to the jury because we were afraid that they would debate the case too long, everyone would leave. Uh, let me just say this from my own reading of the book, and I enjoyed reading it uh, very much, and I commend it to all of you as a, as a fascinating study. Uh, Harry put an enormous amount of time and effort into this. The evidence was overwhelming as far as Thurman's guilt. There's just no question about that. Uh, the, the fact of uh, a confession by both men and a lot of consistencies in those confessions, as pointed out by uh, Mr. Markham, really indicates to me that uh, the evidence, I think, was there uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, Holmes uh, was the accomplice with Thurman. However, the time sequence so ably developed uh, these inconsistencies, all of which were uh, 
were based upon what third party witnesses not what necessarily defense witnesses said have to leave you with with the impression that one of the witnesses one at least one of the third party witnesses was simply mistaken about a critical time period in order to make you feel really comfortable that that Holmes did it beyond any question of a doubt and what of course is the most troubling thing about all this to all of us who care about the rule of law and who care about due process is that Holmes never was given that chance thank you all very much for coming for today thank you Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just glad I could help. I mean, I was there and we had the ideas and you were able to uh, reach the same yeah. point. Do you ever come up and talk to classes and stuff? Uh, um, I have participated in various uh, trial advocacy classes as a witness. witness or as a supervisor who signs the other yeah. agents. I did not want you to understand. <laughs>